if you get home at night and you're laying in bed staring into the darkness and you start thinking about this movie, that excites me and I want people to talk about it after. Um, so I say, like, don't go to it just expecting a conventional horror movie because I think a lot more is going on. What is it? Unlike It Follows or It, there isn't really a monster waiting to attack the main characters in this movie, and that kind of upset a lot of people. I mean, there was the poster that implied It, the trailer that implied It, and even the title that told you It was coming. And while I get why a lot of people are upset, I think they did it on purpose. So, in case you didn't pick it up from my title, spoiler warnings for the movie It Comes at Night, because I'm gonna spoil things. Like the fact that they're all dead, Travis opened the door, and It really represents fear. But let me backtrack and start from the beginning. In order for you to really understand this movie, you gotta look at the director, Trey Edward Schultz. He made the indie hit Krisha that starred his aunt, Krisha, and a bunch of his family members for only $30,000, which is what I would spend on food alone for my set. That movie was impactful because of how it dealt with addictions, but more so asking the question, who would still love you and who would give up on you. It was a story that was personal to him since he had based it off of his cousin who overdosed after a family reunion. He then got a bigger budget and made something even more personal. I mean, it stemmed from a personal place first, you know, and it was losing my dad. And then this movie spewed out of me. Um, and I became like really excited and fascinated by like, if I could put those personal elements into this totally fictional story and see how people took that. I had a messed up relationship with my biological father. Uh, a lot of that was inspired or like was inspiration for Krisha. Um, cut off our relationship, hadn't seen him in over 10 years, and then he got pancreatic cancer and was dying really fast. And then I was with him on his deathbed, and he was so full of regret. Uh, and it was the closest I've ever come to death, and it was traumatic. And like every day after that day, change, you know what I mean? Like, th things take place in your life where you change as a person. So we can assume that Travis represents Trey, as you can kind of see with the names, but also assume that Paul is kind of his biological father, but also his stepfather, which many have pointed out that there's a little bit of a character trait difference between the father and the son here, and I highly doubt that they went lazy on the casting. So knowing that we're seeing the entire movie from the point of view of Travis, you kind of get a better perspective because a lot of people wanted to see a monster. A lot of people were wondering what the virus was and what caused it, but you got to remember... You're asking it from a guy who never intended to give you those answers. His goal wasn't to give you that montage that you see at the beginning of like every zombie movie that then informs you of everything and then you feel high and mighty when you're watching the characters make these oblivious decisions, not realizing that they don't have an episode of The Talking Dead to tell them what to do. The whole point is to see it from the character's point of view. You're seeing it from their perspective. And if they don't know something, you don't know something. If they think something is happening and it's really not, then you have no choice than to see it from their perspective or only just theorize and guess what else could possibly be happening. And while it might be a bit ambiguous, I kind of see it like Pulp Fiction in where we never knew what was in the briefcase or the mystery in Children of Men and why women couldn't get pregnant. Things that we never really got an answer to but it didn't ruin the movie. And I know that it being ambiguous can be annoying to some people because they really want answers, but I think the way that he sets it up is done in a way where you can come up with your own conclusions, considering that I have seen movies where the dude or dudette, I'm pretty sure, only did things because they thought they looked cool and didn't really know what was going on themselves. Here, Schultz says that he knows what happened in the beginning, the middle, and the end, and he just kind of leaves it as a puzzle piece. So I am trusting that as long as he knows what he was doing, then I'm willing to do the work if he knows what was going on. So taking that into consideration, I want to explain how I think things went down. So obviously there's a virus that sends this family into the woods. In my opinion, the virus takes a while to settle and that's what causes the nightmares that we see as one of the side effects. We also see the effects of the gooey eyes, which we first notice on the grandpa, who is the first to be fully infected. And it's so severe that they not only have to shoot him, but they even burn him and then bury him. So it's either a very crazy virus or 
he really hated his father-in-law. It's important to note that the grandpa could have also been sleeping in the same room as Travis, and that could be why he gets sick too, but considering that he's younger and a bit stronger, it takes a while to kick in, but before any of that shows up, a dude shows up who ends up playing the family card to get Paul and convince him to bring his own family, which, in my opinion, it's just a theory. They could kind of be playing off of like a deep pond type of thing where those weren't even his family members. He just kind of used them to, to be able to get Paul to sympathize with him. But there's also the possibility that they are his family members. They get brought in, they settle in, and everything seems hunky-dory. However, at night is when the paranoia kicks in. Paul gets Will drunk on purpose, in my opinion, to have him spill some stuff, and he kind of does, but it's such a small slip-up of calling someone your brother when it's really just your brother-in-law that it's clear that the main purpose of this scene is to stir up paranoia in Paul. We see that they don't go out at night because of that paranoia. Even when the dog goes missing, they don't go after the dog. But Travis continues to have nightmares, or as I see them, subconscious dreams since he sleepwalks. My proof for this is in the very nerdy film grammar that Schultz uses and where he's playing with different camera lenses and aspect ratios to be able to tell the story. Which in simple terms is he, he changes the screen, makes it wider and not wider to, to show you when it's a nightmare and when it's not. During the reality scenes, they're shot in 241 with spherical lenses. The nightmare scenes, however, were shot in 275-1 with anamorphic lenses. And as reality becomes a nightmare, the bars converge on screen, causing it to be more claustrophobic. And as the climax approaches, the shots become more handheld to show the tension. So visually, it leads me to believe that the nightmares were a part of his subconscious and he was kind of going through things, either that sexual awakening that he was going through when there was finally another lady in the house or the fact that he did go after the dog, he did witness his grandpa dying, and these are things that he's dealing with. And in my opinion, he went after the dog because he obviously loved the dog, opened the door considering that the keys were left on the counter for him to take. He is the only one who can reach there. Obviously the little boy can't because he's not MacGyver and he wouldn't have found a way to do that. He goes out, finds the dog mutilated, brings it back in, forgets to close the door, and then he's kind of the one who gets people infected. This does lead to the second family's boy getting sick and it leads to Paul purging them out to protect his family. They're all dead and the crazy part is is that we never even confirmed if the kid was sick. It was just the fear of the possibility of him having the virus. Travis does get sick though. The mom repeats the same thing that she said to the grandpa in the beginning. They put him down and then Paul and his wife sit solemnly at a table as it cuts to black, insinuating that they have the sickness and that they're all dead. Quick thing to note though is that this was kind of like a reworked ending because originally they wanted to end it or Schultz wanted to end it on a nightmare and where the house was burning down and even Joel Edgerton said that it was one of his best performances that he feels he has ever given but they thought it would be a little too confusing to end it on a nightmare considering they've been going back and forth so they kind of filmed it but then had to work around it and that's why you kind of get something that a lot of people feel is abrupt closes it off the way they want it to. However, what does it all mean? This film yeah. is really about the paranoia of the way we look at each other and think, what's in the minds of the people we cross in the street every day? Do they want to cause me uh, harm or, or are, are they going to help me? And there's something about paranoia about this film that's very terrifying. So it are the nightmares. It is the fear that comes at night. It is the paranoia that comes at night. You can be anywhere when it's daylight and all of a sudden when the sun goes down, that area that was fine during the day become scarier, you get more fear, that's what's coming at night, and the doorway that you consistently see in the movie, as Schultz explains, is that gateway to the unknown. It's the thing that's pretty much in the middle of everything that you may fear of that's hiding on the other side, the things that you don't want to come encounter with. And what's interesting about this metaphor with Paul is that it can go both ways. It's not saying whether what he's doing is right or whether it's wrong. And considering that Schultz himself was reading a lot of books on genocide after, you know, grieving with deaths, and I guess that's what you go for, it kind of showed him what people do, what causes people to do acts like that, to kill people just on a hunch almost. And what it came down to was family, that you would do something to protect your family. And what's crazy about it is that this is a tale, considering the political climate that we have now, that isn't so much on the nose because of what's going on again now. It's, it's a story 
that you can look back upon 100 years ago and reflect on it or 100 years from now and just see if the shoe fits because what it's telling you is are you the person to be super scared of the unknown and risk not doing anything risk killing innocent people risk keeping your family on guard and super strictly bound in order to keep them safe or are you the person who are willing to risk your family's safety in order to be able to build a community there is no right or wrong answer in my opinion because in one you're risking your family and one you're risking the other people and bringing them in and it's that's what makes the movie interesting the debate that it brings and i think it's a lot better than a monster movie could have done and where you just get these shock horrors and stuff like that and it doesn't really make you think about what you would do in that scenario like what i really love about those movies is what the horror does to the people you know, uh, if you look at The Thing or Night of the Living Dead, I think it's less about the monster, less about the zombies, and it's more about the fear and the paranoia it instills in those people. Um, so I was excited by that. And I was also excited at the idea of like a family drama in that um, and caring about these people and these stories and, and, and yeah. So overall, I believe the marketing was done to dupe you because one, they wanted to get butts in seats. Two, it's A24, they've done this in the past. They're cool with like 60 or 70% of audiences hating it, as long as that 30 or 40% end up finding a movie that they might end up adoring. And three, it kind of plays with that aspect of fear and the unknown and wanting to be able to cross that red door because people wanted to see a movie that scared them and they didn't really want to see a movie that was going to make them think. It may have not had a lot of jump scares, but hopefully it had you contemplating on what you would do in that scenario and to see what side of the door you're on. So maybe ask yourself what's behind your door and question, would you be willing to open it?